a standing ovation. <laughs> Is this microphone on? No. D does this work? M mine is on. Hello? Yeah. Herb, I know you never wear T-shirts. <laughs> and so I thought I'd try to reform you by presenting you with this new product of uh, our website. Religion, together we can find the cure. <laughs> so, Let's hang it up here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. You've converted me into wearing T-shirts from now on. <laughs> you know, I'm not used to walking out on the stage and getting a standard ovation, and I really enjoy it, even though I know it's not for me. <laughs> but, you know, Richard, I'd like to start by saying, as a distinguished evolutionary biologist, you did two things that very few academics or scientists ever even attempt. First, you wrote expository books uh, like The Selfish Gene uh, to explain science to non-scientists. But then you also became the most famous atheist in the known universe. Now, <laughs> was it your interest in promoting science to the general public that motivated you to engage with religion? I love truth. And I think that the truth about the world, the truth about the universe, is utterly exciting. Um, it's enthralling, it's exhilarating. And it knocks into a cocked hat the sort of parochial, petty, medieval, pre-medieval, dark age uh, view of the world, which is the religious view. And therefore, Going against religion is, for me, an integral part of uh, being an expository writer about science. I, I couldn't imagine doing one without the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you. And speaking of uh, religion and science, you know, we have here an annual Darwin Week at the College of Charleston. I'm delighted to hear that. That's wonderful. To well, there, there might be one concern you have that it's organized by an evolutionary biologist who's also a committed Christian. And he and others believe that evolution and science are compatible. And that if people had to choose one or the other, especially here in the Bible Belt, most would wind up rejecting evolution. Do you think religion and science are compatible? They're clearly compatible in the strict sense that there are many religious scientists. And um, Francis Collins is one name that's always mentioned, John Polkinghorne's another. Um, when, you, when you meet a religious scientist, you ask exactly what do you believe? In the case of Francis Collins, in the case of John Polkinghorne, you'll get standard Christianity. Uh, in many cases, you won't get that. In many cases, what you'll get is a kind of Einsteinian pantheism. You'll get people who say, oh, I believe there's something mysterious in the universe. There's something, mm -hmm. there's a deep uh, mystery, and I feel almost mystical when I look up at the stars. And of course, we all do. If we've got any imagination, that's what we do. That's what Carl Sagan did. That's what Einstein did. Um, Einstein was fond of using religious imagery. Einstein uh, said, what I really want to know is, did he, meaning did God, uh, have any choice in creating the universe? That didn't mean that Einstein believed in God. No. What it meant was that Einstein was, was a poetic way of saying, is there more than one way for a universe to be, or is there only, is there only one way? When Einstein said, but he does not play dice, I mean, again, he meaning God, does not play dice, um, he was expressing his skepticism of Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle. Right. Um, many times, scientists who sound religious are actually only religious in the Einsteinian sense. But still, there are plenty of them who are genuinely religious, who are devout Christians. No doubt your colleague is mm -hmm. one of them. Um, any self-respecting bishop or archbishop or cardinal or indeed pope um, does believe in evolution. Uh, that comes as something of a surprise, I think, to um, some fundamentalist 
as yeah, fun, fundamentalist yeah. Christians. I personally do find an incomp incompatibility, but that seems to be just me because there are, as I say, uh, plenty of um, plenty of religious scientists. Yeah, and and I I'm not sure if it's just that uh, a lot of them were raised religious and feel that they need to keep in the religion of their birth because of their family or whether they really believe. And I, I enjoy saying, okay, you believe in God, what's your God like? And just to see if it's yeah. some supernatural being watching over you or is it some kind of a theistic God that then created the universe and retired yes. to deity emeritus. Yeah. Or even less, <laughs> or, or even less, the, I mean, a, a, a deist God who, who retired seems to me to be every bit as improbable, no, not quite nearly as, Im as improbable as a, as a, as a theistic God. Um, but I thought you were starting to say that many people um, who are observant members of a religious tradition, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I'm not an observant Christian, but I consider myself a cultural Christian in the sense that I, I mean, I, I know a lot about the Bible, I go to church on Christmas and ca sing carols and things. Um, I think this applies to Jews probably even more. Yeah. I mean, there's a sort of more of a, a loyalty to, a, to, a, a, to an ancient tradition, um, which many Jews um, who are atheists nevertheless um, respect and actually perform Jewish ceremonies. Uh, I don't think you do that, but, but, that, but you probably have atheist friends who do. Mm -hmm. um, I've hugely enjoyed your autobiography. Um, which Sean mentioned at the beginning. I need, I think I wrote the foreword to, to it. Yes, to, yes to, and <laughs> I, I hugely enjoyed the foreword to my autobiography. Um, and I, I wanted to quote um, from right, right at the beginning, uh, a rabbi delivered a moving sermon telling how we are nothing in this vast universe and that we must let God know we are appropriately humble. After the sermon, the assistant rabbi ran to the front of the congregation and yelled, I am nothing. Next, the rabbi's wife ran up and shouted, I am nothing. The president of the congregation did the same. Then a newcomer ran up yelling, I am nothing. At that, an old congregant poked the man sitting next to him and complained, so look who thinks he's nothing. <laughs> and um, Herb used this as an example for um, the... Uh, the difficulty which anybody faces when writing an autobiography. He says, although anyone who writes about himself must have a bit of an ego, mine isn't so big that I think everything about me is noteworthy. Um, but th this, uh, uh, I think at lunchtime today, Herb, you did add that uh, m myself is the only thing that I'm the world authority on. Right. Which is <laughs> um, and you also wrote, writing your life story is more like being a suicide bomber you only get to do it once. <laughs> so after reading about my life, perhaps you'll be inspired to write about yours. Well, it's funny you should say that because um, I have, in fact, just completed volume one of my autobiography. <laughs> um, and well, I'm glad that I inspired you. you. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, it's too late to ask for your advice on how to write volume one because it's unfortunately just finished. But volume two hasn't even started yet. And mm -hmm. so I would like to discuss with you the problems of how to write an autobiography b being humble and yet at the same time acknowledging that because you've been persuaded by publishers to do it, presumably somebody's interested in reading it. I mean, um, how are we going to do it? Well, you've done it already. How do we do this? Well, uh, frankly, Richard, it's a lot easier for me to be humble than it is for you. <laughs> because, you know, publishers didn't run begging me to write my autobiography. I wanted to do it in large part because, you know, I had come out as an atheist. And I decided after that, let me just come out with my life. So I have essentially no secrets left, much to my wife Sharon's dismay. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's the sort of thing that I really wanted to write an honest account. And I have another advantage over you. Here, I'm a Jewish atheist living in the Bible Belt. So that automatically gave me a lot of funny stories to write about. <laughs> and, well, tell us some of them. because <laughs> Well, a lot of them are in the book. Yeah. Uh, but 
you know, just running for governor. And the reason I ran uh, for governor is because I found out here in South Carolina, atheists were not allowed to become governor. So, of course, that made me want to run. And it took, <laughs> and it took about eight years, uh, first as a candidate for governor, and uh, the uh, uh, judge ruled that he would only rule on the emirates if I won the election. Well, you know, to the surprise of no one, I lost. <laughs> but then I found out I was ineligible for any public office. And the only one that I had a chance of winning, not even dog catcher, uh, would be notary public. So I applied uh, for notary public, and eventually with uh, the South Carolina Supreme Court acknowledged that, yes, we should follow the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so I was granted my notary public after eight years. And, and that's a large part of my autobiography. But I also wrote about my family life. I grew up as an Orthodox Jew, where I thought like Reformed Jews were almost as bad as Gentiles. That's what we learned. <laughs> and you know, eventually, uh, starting to be logical, reaching the age of reason, I, started, I decided I'll keep the parts of my religion that make sense to me and discard those that don't. And it wasn't very long till God went also. Yeah. Well, I love the bit uh, when you were running for, for governor to show the sincerity of your real motive. I think a reporter asked you um, what would be your first act if you were to be elected. And I think you said uh, resign or, or... No, no, or demand no. a recount. De uh, demand a recount. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Or they even asked me, uh, uh, what would it take to make you believe in God? And I said... Well, maybe if I won the election, <laughs> it, would, it would take that kind of a miracle. Uh, but, you know, aside uh, from having uh, their religious beliefs punctured, some people are skeptical about evolution because it, in their mind, takes too long to see any results. What do you think is the simplest evidence for evolution uh, to convince the unscientifically minded. Okay, well, on the point about it taking too long to get results, that of course is true, and uh, that's inevitably true, and if you don't understand that, you can't even begin to understand. I mean, mm -hmm. if you expect, as some people do, you know, I'll believe in evolution when I see a monkey give birth to a human, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so you do have to appreciate that it, is, it does take a very, very yeah. long time and you have to appreciate that there is a very, very long time available. And you know there are various analogies that have been developed to, um, to express this. And one of them that I like, it's not my own, so I can, I can plug it, um, is to stretch your arm out <coughs> and say the origin of life is where my bow tie would be if I had one as beautiful as yours. <laughs> um, the origin of life is there and the present is the tip of my longest finger. Uh, and then you ask, um, what, have, what have we got as we walk along my arm? Well, it's all bacteria out to about there. Um, we're talking about four billion years. It's all bacteria out to about there. Dinosaurs come in about there. Um, uh, humans come in, or hominid-like creatures, human-like creatures come in at about my near the tip of my fingernail, and the whole of human history, the whole of recorded history, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the ancient Greeks, the Hebrews, the Romans, the whole of human history falls as the dust from one stroke of the nail file. That's how insignificant historical time, human historical time is, compared to geological time, and it's geological time that we're dealing with when we talk about evolution. So that's one thing to get across, is the sheer magnitude of the time that's available. It doesn't actually need all that much time. Evolution is actually faster than it needs to be. Um, th there's more time than is, than is required in order, for, in, order for it to, in order for it to work. But you ask me, what's the single most convincing evidence for it? Um, surprisingly, it's not fossils, I think. Fossils are very convincing, and, and, and contrary to creationist myths, there are lots and lots of them, and they do show a very beautiful 
uh, evolutionary progression. Uh, cre creationists often say, where are your intermediates? Where, well, of course, there are plenty of intermediates. There are some gaps. In the case of the turbillarian flatworms, there's one big gap because there aren't any fossils at all. This is a very large, diverse, beautiful, elegant group of animals which simply doesn't have any fossils. Um, so either they were all born yesterday. Um, <laughs> used to go, okay, you get, you get the point. Not all animals do fossilize. But what, what is really telling is that there's not a single fossil in the wrong place. There are plenty of places where it would be nice to have a fossil, and there isn't one. But as J.B.S. Haldane said, when asked what would disprove evolution, he said, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any, and there's nothing remotely like that. There are no fossils in the wrong place. But fossils, even so, convincing as that is, are not the most convincing evidence. I think the most convincing evidence is probably molecular, uh, something that wasn't available to Darwin. Darwin was very convinced and convincing about comparative evidence. He looked at the comparative skeletons, for example, of mammals and showed that the, the human hand has all the same parts, down to extreme detail, um, as a bat's wing or a whale's flipper or a rat's paw uh, or a horse's hoof toes missing. Um, nowadays, we can do that with, mo with molecules, and it's many orders of magnitude more convincing, because with DNA, or with the protein that is directly <coughs> produced by DNA coding, you've got enormous quantities of digital literary text in every one of your cells and in every one of the cells of every living creature that's ever been looked at. And you can directly compare these literary texts exactly as a biblical scholar might compare different uh, versions of the book of Isaiah or something like that. And you can look for changes, letter by letter changes, and show that there is overwhelming evidence that living things fall on a family tree, or at least a tree, and there's no other explanation for having a tree like that of such detailed branching shape as a family tree. And you can do it for this molecule and that molecule and the other molecule, and you get essentially the same tree. To me, that is the most convincing evidence. Um, almost equally convincing is the evidence from geographical distribution. Um, the distribution of animals and plants on the islands and continents of the world is exactly the way it should be if evolution has taken place, and exactly the way it should not be if they had all dispersed from a ship marooned on the top of Mount Ararat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, you know, yeah, there are people who say, well, I believe in microevolution, but not macroevolution because humans are special, that God just created humans. Uh, and the way you describe it, I could see why a lot of people uh, re might reject evolution uh, because if we're special and the way we had bacteria and everything else over millions of years, uh, if there were a God, we would seem, humans would seem to be an afterthought. Yes, I mean, it, it, I, don't, I simply don't understand how anyone can think that all the rest of the animal kingdom has evolved, but we haven't. I mean, we are so incredibly similar to chimpanzees, mm -hmm. I mean, far more similar to chimpanzees than, than chimpanzees are to monkeys, for example. Um, so um, that, that, that simply doesn't uh, make any sense. Macroevolution and microevolution, um, these are words that professional biologists do use, but they're, but they're particularly favorite words of, cre of creationists. Macroevolution is what you get when microevolution goes on for a very long time. It's as simple as that. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Um, it's a bit like um, the, 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 the transition from, from baby to adult, you might say, is macro development. Um, and it happens gradually. Nobody ever, um, well, from adult to say, middle age to, to, to old, it's not something that suddenly happened. You don't go to bed in middle age and wake up next morning and say, I seem to be old uh, <laughs> this morning. It all happens gradually. And that's the same thing with microevolution. It happens gradually. And when enough of it has happened over an, a sufficient number of millions of years, what you've got 
is a change big enough to be called macro. That's all there is to it. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I, I even wondered about this. Humans have souls, but other animals don't. But for those who accept evolution, what about the first human who came from non-humans? So yeah. you know, the soul um, problem seems to be yes. quite problematic. This is, this, is standard, this is now current Roman Catholic doctrine. That, that Yes, yes, we are evolved. Yes, yes, we are cousins of chimpanzees. But at some point, God stepped in with his divine hypodermic and injected, <laughs> injected the soul. Um, so, as you say, there, that, that, that seems to suggest that there was a moment when a pair of hominids of some sort, maybe they were ar archaic Homo sapiens, maybe they were Homo erectus, and they looked down into their grass cradle somewhere on the African plains and said, we seem to have given birth to the first ensouled Homo sapiens. <laughs> yeah, and I think your wonderful book uh, and your latest one, The Magic of Reality, talks about why there couldn't have been a first human like that. And I think the book is very pro-science, but not necessarily anti-religion. You simply give different creation myths along with the biblical one, and then you follow it by verifiable scientific explanations for what really happened. Now, such a, an awesome scientific history is, to me, the greatest story ever told. And I'm wondering if you called the story magic, as in the magic of reality, because that was awesome kind of magic. Yes. Um, well... And what do you mean by magic? Yes, I mean, I, I think you, you could mean three different things by, by magic. What, one of them is magic spells, as in fairy tales, where princes turn into frogs, or is it frogs turn into princes, that, that kind of thing. That's macroevolution. Yes. <laughs> Macro, yeah. Um, and, and the next is stage magic, con conjuring tricks, um, which can be so incredible that you sort of, you're almost forced to believe they're supernatural, but then if the conjurer is honest, he'll tell you, no, it's not. It's, it really is only a trick. There are some conjurers who are fakes and charlatans who actually make a good living pretending that what they have are what they call super uh, paranormal powers. Uh, there's one who I won't mention because he's the most litigious person on the planet. Um, <laughs> he, I once got a letter from a lawyer, from his lawyer, because I had referred to a spoon-bending charlatan. <laughs> and it seemed he recognized himself. <laughs> We're getting ringing. Could we stop it? Thank you. Um, hello? Okay, um, so that's the second kind of magic. Oh, and by the way, this, this same spoon-bending charlatan has, I believe, been paid large sums by oil companies, if you please, to use his psychic powers to divine where to dig for oil. <laughs> that's the second kind of magic. The third kind of magic is the magic of reality. The magic that you feel in your soul, even, when, as I said earlier, you look up at the stars, when you look up at the Milky Way, when you contemplate the expanding universe, when you look into a microscope, when you look into an electron microscope and see the astonishing complexity and elegance of living things, when you look at the Grand Canyon and you see the geological strata laid out before you. This is all magical. Reality is magical. And we've all been anesthetized by familiarity with reality because we experience reality every day since we were born and so we forget how utterly astounding it is to be given the privilege of living in this universe mm -hmm. and science gives you the privilege of understanding it the privilege of understanding why you're here what it is how big it is how old it is how did it start how it's going to end how did life start uh, what was the history of life this is granted to you as a citizen of the 21st century. It was not granted to a citizen of the 17th century or the 18th century. It was about half granted to a citizen of the 19th century. Um, and so it is an astonishing privilege, and it's magical to enjoy that privilege of living in reality and, and understanding it.
<laughs> that was, to me, a very moving explanation, with one exception. And that was when you say, I felt deep in my soul. What I worry is that there are going to be people yeah. out there who say, uh, even Richard Dawkins believes in yeah. souls. Yeah. You uh, have to watch your language. Yeah, and that's the, yeah. what you were talking about, uh, Albert Einstein and yeah, others yeah, who can yeah. misinterpret no, you, our no, terminology. You're, you're, you're totally right, Herb, and, and, and I should have been more careful. Um, <laughs> we, we knew what you meant not, here. Not that there's anybody in here who would, who would misunderstand <laughs> that, but, but this is going to go out, it's being filmed, and it's going to go out. Um, let me tell you a cautionary tale about that. Can I? Sure. Um, I was having a debate in Oxford with a, actually a mathematician. Um, and uh, I knew, because I'd had a previous debate with him, that he literally believes that Jesus was born of a virgin and literally believes that Jesus turned water into wine. And this astonished me because I was accustomed to the idea of being, being told. I mean, I'd been, as it were, bullied for going after easy targets, going after fundamentalist nut jobs when what I should have been doing is going after sophisticated theologians. Here was a sophisticated theologian who believed that Jesus turned water into wine. And I was sort of staggered by this. Anyway, I met him a couple of years later in another debate in Oxford. And I wanted to make the point that here was a sophisticated theologian who believed these astonishingly naive things. Now, I used... Um, a technique which I've called the Eddington Concession. Eddington was a famous astronomer who wanted to make the point that the second law of thermodynamics has something very, very special about it. There's something, the second law of thermodynamics is a, is a scientific law like no other, was what the point he wanted to make. And he, he made it like this. He used a rhetorical trick. He said, you may your theory may disagree with Maxwell's equations. Well, so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. Your theory may disagree with observed facts. Well, so much the worse for the observed facts. These experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory disagrees with the second law of thermodynamics, I can offer you no hope. There is nothing for it but to... But to I think he said, dissolve in deepest humiliation. <laughs> now, you see what Eddington was doing. He wasn't for one moment saying that he disagreed with Maxwell's equations. He wasn't for one moment saying that experimental physicists really do bungle things all the time. He was using the rhetorical trick of going out of his way, bending over backwards to make concessions in order to emphasize that this really, really special point about the second law. And I call that the Eddington concession. I used the Eddington Concession on this Oxford mathematician. I said to him, I could just about believe that there's a deistic God who created the universe and created the laws of physics and set it all going and set up conditions such that uh, um, galaxies would form and stars would form and chemistry, elements would, would condense, chemistry would form, life would start, evolution and so on. I could just about believe in a deistic God I don't actually believe in it, but that at least would be a respectable idea. We could have an argument about that. But <laughs> my opponent on this platform believes that Jesus turned water into wine. <laughs> okay? You see what I was doing? I was using the Eddington Concession in order to emphasize the absurdity of his believing that Jesus turned water into wine. And he muttered and fumbled and couldn't really handle it. Two days later, he went up to Scotland and gave a speech. I wasn't there, but a colleague of mine was. She was sitting in the audience. She took notes, detailed notes. And what he said to that Scottish audience was, two days ago, I was in Oxford, and Dawkins agreed that there is a deistic God. <laughs> oh, no. He, he, he didn't quite say that. That's not quite fair. He said, Dawkins moved a long way to accepting that there is a deistic God. This is real progress. <laughs> Now, that is dishonest. Yeah. That is flagrantly dishonest. He must have known that I was using, I didn't call it the Eddington Concession, but he must have understood the rhetorical trick I was, I was using. He, he clearly didn't 
didn't really believe that I had made a concession. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was sheer dishonesty. This is what we call lying for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, Herb, to pull me up on, that was rather a long digression, but, <laughs> but you're right to pull me up on having used the word soul, um, because one is vulnerable to somebody um, wantonly and mendaciously um, saying that I believe in the soul in the sense of, say, something immortal that goes on after we're dead. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of evolution, there are some people who don't necessarily attack the science of evolution, but its consequences, like it leads to social Darwinism, Darwinism the uh, survival of the fittest, and then, of course, uh, uh, the Holocaust. You know, what I really liked about your book is that uh, the magic of reality is, to me, I, I got the opposite impression for instance, one of the things I like the best, and I think uh, children would also especially appreciate it, is uh, the picture you had of ancestors over uh, different generations who barely resembled you, but uh, eventually stopped resembling you. And then you went to uh, your 185th million great-great-grandfather, and you turn the page, and it shows a picture of a fish. Yeah. <laughs> now, su that, such a, a visual puts into perspective, I think, these fights that we have today about our differences on race, ethnicity, uh, uh, gender, sexual orientation, yeah. when we think, you know, yeah. we, have, we came, all came from this fish. Yeah. We all came from this fish, but we, all humans, are extremely close cousins. We yeah. are actually a very uniform species. It's hard to... To, to realize that because we see w apparently great differences and maybe that our senses are particularly geared to see great dis differences or it may be that um, the differences are all superficial, things, mm -hmm. like, um, things like skin color. But actually, if you look at it genetically, uh, the human species is far more uniform than many other species, including chimpanzees. It's been said that um, two chimpanzees in the same forest are genetically more different from each other than any two human beings anywhere in the world. So humans are a very, very unique, uh, uniquely uniform, uh, uniform species. We are very, very close cousins. It, it's, um, it's, it's a salutary political lesson to mm -hmm. say how, how, how closely related, uh, related we are. The accusation that, that Darwinism leads to, leads to social Darwinism, leads to, leads to ultimately to, to, to Nazism, um, is, a, is a vile calumny. Um, it's frequently used. Uh, even if it were true, it wouldn't make Darwinism false. Right. Um, I mean, what's scientifically true is scientifically true, whether or not it ha has ever been used to, um, to um, inspire uh, horrible political doctrines. Actually, if you search the pages of Bein Kampf, you will find not a single mention of Darwin, not a single mention of evolution, plenty of mentions of God and providence. Um, so Hitler himself, although he's said to have been inspired by, by Darwin, doesn't seem to have been in any very mm. obvious way. But even if he was, that would have absolutely no bearing whatever on whether Darwinian evolution is the correct explanation for, the, for, for life, which it is. Right. And I do want to give thanks here to my great, 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 uh, 185th great grandfather. And just to not be sexist, also to my 185th great grandmother, even though they weren't married. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Richard, you've said that raising children as religious fundamentalists is a form of child abuse. Not quite. I, I, I said that t telling children about hell um, is a form of child abuse. Mm -hmm. And I've said that labeling children, I think, I think few people would dispute that telling children about hell is a form of child abuse, but labeling ch children is slightly harder to get. And you get it as soon as you imagine that thought experiment of labeling a child, what should we say, a postmodernist child, <laughs> a secular humanist child, a Marxist child, um, a liberal uh, socialist child. You don't do that. Nobody talks about a Gramscian Marxist child. 
<laughs> but plenty of people talk about a Catholic child mm -hmm. or a Muslim child or a Protestant child. It seems to be that religion has got a free pass in our society, even among those of us who are not religious, a free pass to be al to allowed to call children by the religion of their parents, even four-year-old children, three-year-old children. I cited in support of this a charming photograph which was published in the independent newspaper in London one Christmas. And it was a, he trying to get the Christmas spirit, it was trying to evoke the spirit of ecumenicalism. And it had a picture of three little children, three little four-year-old children, in a nativity play. And it gave their names, um, Shadbreet, a Muslim, somebody else a Sikh, somebody else a Christian. And they were playing the three wise men in the nativity play. A four-year-old Sikh, a four-year-old Muslim, and a four-year-old Christian. What on earth are you doing labeling children Christian, mm -hmm. Muslim, and Sikh when these children haven't the faintest idea what that means? Mm -hmm. Would you ever call a child a Hayekian child or a Keynesian child? Mm -hmm. Of course you wouldn't. And as soon as you get that, as soon as you hear me say Keynesian child, you immediately realize that you're never ever going to let anybody get away with calling a child a Catholic child or a Jewish child or a Muslim child or a Protestant child again. <laughs> yeah. now, now, Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg said, with or without religion, there will be good people doing good things and bad people doing bad things. But for good people to do bad things, that takes religion. <laughs> now, now, I wondered if you agreed with that, or do you think, as many do, that fear of a god keeps some morally challenged people from committing atrocities? Well, Herb, I think it was you who said uh, in your book somewhere um, that if you ask somebody, why are you good? And he says, I'm good because God... Well, if, yeah. I didn't, if I didn't believe in God, I'd go out and rape and murder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then you're going to edge away from, from him. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, what, what uh, people have said to me, well, as an atheist, I suppose you feel free to go out and rape and murder and do whatever you think you can get away with. And I, I usually would respond, well, with an attitude like that, I hope you continue to believe in a God. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> because I really don't think they do. And in debates with fundamentalists, I've asked, like, how would you behave differently if you stopped believing in a God? And some of them have a lot of trouble explaining that. One fundamentalist minister said that, you know, I've often been tempted uh, by other women but I didn't act on that because of my love for Jesus. You see, it, because it, because yes. it would hurt Jesus. Yeah, it? because I, it, I know it would hurt Jesus. Yes. So that gave me such an easy opening. I was tempted too, but I don't because of my love for my wife Sharon, because I know how it would hurt Sharon. And even the minister's wife seemed to like my answer better. <laughs> It is, it is actually, it's, it's an astonishing idea that the only reason you're good is that you're frightened of the great spy camera in the sky. Um, uh, I mean, what a terribly ignoble reason to be good. You're only good because you're frightened of being found mm -hmm. out. Um, well, maybe people are, but that's a very cynical view of humanity. And it's not what I would call morality it's not, either. certainly not morality, no. Um, and, or, or frightened of, of um, going to hell. The, the other reason people may give for um, uh, being good if they're religious is that they think they get it from Scripture. And they often cite the Ten Commandments. And what happens when that happens is you, you have to ask them, do you actually know what the Ten Commandments <laughs> say? And they don't. They, all, they only know, they know one or possibly two. They don't know the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. They don't know the second commandment, um, what is it, thou, thou shalt... Um, um, is that, what is it again? 
that, 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 that thou, shalt make, that thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, um, thou, thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy, and so on and so on. Then they come to thou shalt not kill. Well, everybody knows thou shalt not kill. Um, <laughs> and I love uh, Christopher Hitchens' response to that, um, which, which I actually like to, to think of in the voice of John Cleese. <laughs> Moses comes down from the mountain bearing the tablets and all the uh, children of Israel gather around and look at it and they say, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, how silly of me. You see, <laughs> we thought that killing was a terrific idea. <laughs> oh, silly me. <laughs> you don't need tablets of stone to say, Thou shalt not kill. And you don't need tablets of stone of stone to say, thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, thou shalt have no other gods before me. These people want to stick the Ten, ten Commandments up in courtrooms and schoolhouses, and they don't know what's on the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt not covet your neighbor's uh, wife or ox or any other of his property. Shall I make my joke about that? <laughs> of course. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or her ass. <laughs> uh, switching over to a more dignified, just for a moment. <laughs> now, uh, Richard, I know that uh, your The Out campaign is very serious and important to you. Uh, what, what advice would you give for people in places like South Carolina, and I've heard a lot of this, who just fear the hostile reactions from friends or in the workplace for coming out as an atheist. Well, the art campaign um, is, in a way, modeled on the gay uh, right. campaign at, um, um, coming out. It's, it's not a campaign to make people come out, and nor should it be in the gay case either. I mean, we, mm -hmm. We're not in the business of, yeah. of, um, of outing people. Um, but to, to show that atheists are nice people, decent people, ordinary people, loving people, um, people such as you would meet all the time in any profession, um, to be an example um, is probably the best thing we can do. Uh, I know that it's very difficult for many people, especially in this country, to come out because they fear uh, the, um, the reaction of their family, perhaps. Um, I've heard numerous stories of young people in America who have completely lost their religious faith and they call themselves atheists privately, but they don't want to come out and say so uh, because they are afraid of upsetting their parents. In some cases, more than upsetting their parents, they actually get thrown out. Um, this is an extraordinary reaction for what's merely a difference of opinion about the cosmos and, and uh, the way society should be run and things like that. Um, it's an astonishing violation of the normal um, parental love um, or grandparental or, or whatever it is. So it, it is difficult, but when people discover that, that ordinary, nice, pleasant, decent, law-abiding, tax-paying people are atheists. It, it must make a, a huge um, mm -hmm. difference. Herb, I think you, you said sometime, somebody said to you, you're the only atheist I've ever met, and you said... Um, you're, you're, no, you're, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm the only open atheist. The uh, only, only uh, one who says so, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, because yeah. You know, for every person they know is an atheist, especially here, there are hundreds of people who just don't acknowledge being yes. an atheist. Yeah. Well, I've been enormously encouraged, especially in the so-called Bible Belt in America, um, we tend to concentrate my lecture tours in the Bible Belt. Uh, and um, what's in enormously encouraging is that um, time after time in the book signing queue, uh, afterwards when people are coming along to have the book signed, they will say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you've inspired me to come out. You've inspired me. I mean, I'm an atheist. May, may say, I don't dare say I'm an atheist, but I am. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a real... Uh, it's a real uh, thing we can do um, to, to encourage people in, actually, frankly, in places like South Carolina, I suppose, um, to, uh, to, to enc encourage people to, um, 
to stand up for their, mm -hmm. for their convictions. I'm also encouraged by the number of people in all walks of life, waiters in restaurants, taxi drivers, bus drivers, um, who astonishing, astonish me by saying they've read my books uh, and, and, agree, and agree with them. And uh, it's a very, very moving thing for, for me to have mm -hmm. that, uh, to have that mm -hmm. experience. And they're not all okay. academics. Okay, uh, Richard, you've heard the expression to be more Catholic than the Pope, uh, meaning ultra-Catholic. Well, you inadvertently created a meme of being more atheist than Richard Dawkins. <laughs> and that's because of something you said in The God Delusion, where you rate God belief on a seven-point scale with one absolute certainty in God's existence and seven, absolute certainty in his non-existence. And you call yourself a six. Many atheists, myself included, put ourselves closer to, say, 6.8 or 6.9. Why are you only a six? No, I, I, Please explain yeah, yourself, okay. Richard. I, I, think, uh, I think I haven't invented... I mean, 6.9 is, is, is what... You, I mean, I, I'm... An, I'm I'm a seven in the, in the same sense as I would be a seven about fairies and leprechauns. Um, uh, there is, you cannot actually disprove leprechauns. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, and gods are the same. I mean, I, I'm an atheist about Yahweh in the same way as I'm an atheist about Baal and Mithras uh -huh. and Osiris and, um, and Jupiter and Apollo and Thor. Okay, well, I think we have the same God beliefs then. <laughs> I would love to continue this for a few hours, but it seems like other people would like to ask questions too. Uh, so why don't we open it up to the audience for questions? And don't, uh, don't look at me. Now we have the person who has the toughest job here, and that's uh, John Huddleston from, <laughs> from the uh, Religious Studies Department. At the Thank you. So yes, we're going to open it up with some questions. Uh, wow, a lot of people here. Do you think if the rapture happened <laughs> this evening, would the room remain intact? Or <laughs> so questions. Please keep your questions uh, short and to the point, the so that we can get as many questions as possible. And we have people with microphones uh, on this side. Also, where's the other individual with the microphone? Sean, okay, here. Yeah, so we'll start. Go ahead. In, in regards to uh, knowing his big boat, I, I never see you talking about population bottleneck in DNA as the evidence as it, uh, for it never has happened. Uh, well, I, I never hear you talk about uh, population bottleneck. Or I have that well, you haven't listened very hard then. Um, um, uh, it, it looks very much as though humans went through a population bottleneck. What a population bottleneck is... Uh, is my microphone working? Yeah. What a population bottleneck is, is... Well, it's sort of obvious, really. Um, uh, the population of a species is reduced almost to extinction, to just maybe a few thousand individuals. And for some reason, it didn't quite go extinct, and then it expanded again. And there's, you can get evidence for that from, uh, from looking at, at, the gen, at the genetics of a modern population. It appears that the cheetah, that ultra-fast um, African cat, um, has been through a population bottleneck uh, within the last few tens of thousands of years. But the cheetah um, gene pool is very, very restricted compared to other big cats. Um, so they've been through a bottleneck, and we have too. I mentioned earlier that uh, human I mentioned earlier that human genetic variation is very low compared to many other species, including including uh, chimpanzees. What I didn't mention is that the probable reason for that is that humans went through a bottleneck some 75,000 years ago or thereabouts. I didn't quite understand what that had to do with with um, uh, Utna Pashtim and his. Um, great boat, which he was encouraged to build by one of the gods uh, when great rain was threatened. You'll be aware, of course, that the legend of Noah is inherited from the Sumerians, a much older, older legend. Yes, can oh, right over here. Yes, I was wondering about that same population bottleneck. If um, 
you know, since we're more likely to feel altruistic to people who are related to us, like our siblings, if pack behavior is, is somehow correlated to a lack of genetic diversity in a species, so maybe that bottleneck would make humans more altruistic, and if we see that in other animals. That's an ingenious suggestion, but it doesn't work. Um, because the, you, I don't know whether everybody is aware of the underlying theory that the questioner has in mind, which is the theory of kin selection. Um, natural selection favors altruism towards close kin, and the reason is that close kin are more likely to share the genes for altruism. Now, that has to be interpreted rather more subtly than that. Um, Close kin has to be defined against a background of the general population. And so natural selection will favor altruism towards kin that are closer than the population at large. If the population at large happens to be very closely related because of a genetic bottleneck, then that is the genetic background against which relatedness is compared and so you're still going to get extra altruism towards close relatives, towards brothers, sisters, nephews and nieces and so on. You're not going to get altruism towards everybody that you meet simply because everybody that you meet is by chimpanzee standards a cousin. You have to consider, you have to, the, the theory explicitly t takes account of the relative degree of relationship compared to the background population. If the background population are all the equivalent of, say, fourth cousins, then uh, that's the background against which true relatedness is measured. So ingenious, but uh, as they say, no cigar. Yes, right over here. All right, well, let me stand up. I'm going to send a penny to you with uh, Dr. Cornwell, is it? Have I mangled your name? It's an Indian head penny. It's uh, um, of the style that was last uh, made here in the United States that are godless. So my question is actually kind of to you. Do, are, are there any English currencies that are godless, or have you been cursed with the deity on your currencies <laughs> forever um, and ever? Well, I'm aware that, the, uh, that, uh, that American dollar bills um, and, and other bills have, in God we trust, um, written on them. I'm also aware that that's an astonishingly recent ancient tradition. Um, it goes back... <laughs> I think it goes back to 1950. 54, during 54. the McCarthy era, yeah. to prote protect us from godless communism. Yes. Well, since the faith-based initiative of 9-11, perhaps we should take it off our yeah. currency. Yeah. Uh, but I, what, what's rather, it rather annoying is that many Americans think that it goes back to the, to the founding fathers, which it doesn't. Right. Um, you ask about English currency. I'm happy to say that the, Engli the British, no, the English, I suppose, 10-pound note, has a very large portrait of Charles Darwin on it. Wow. <laughs> As an educator, um, I find it hard to, in the age of testing, allow students to think critically and explore. How do you suggest that individual educators shape the generations of the future? You want to answer? <laughs> um, I, well, I, you know, I think critical thinking is certainly essential in all areas. I know as a mathematician, uh, I don't talk about God or atheism, but I do tell people don't just rely on what a previous teacher said. Like, I'd often say things like, uh, Why can't you divide by zero? And they say, Well, I learned that in high school. But what's the reason? Always go for the reason or for the evidence rather than let people just memorize stuff. And that's how I think educators should be teaching. Um, in, in Herb's book, he said, while mathematicians are less likely than the overall population to believe in deities, they are more likely to believe than scientists. A possible reason for this phenomenon might be that some theoretical branches of mathematics, including the one in which I do research, have nothing to do with the real world. <laughs> yeah, and, and in fact, I, I, growing up in Orthodox Judaism, it, a lot of it made sense from a mathematical standpoint. You start with certain axioms, and you build from those axioms and have a logical framework. 
the reason you get nonsense out of it is because the axioms are bad. Uh, so yeah. you can be logical, but start with bad assumptions. Yeah. So just keep in mind what's logical versus what there's evidence for as well. As, as you said in your book, mathematicians like theologians are free to make assumptions and construct their own imaginary little worlds based on these assumptions. So and, mathematicians, and mathematicians understand that that's what we're doing. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, a question over here. Over here. In the beginning, you said that it's, you were opposed to religious fundamentalism. And I think on your website, you were talking about that was some of the things that you were combating. How would you define religious fundamentalism? And does that also include um, Islam and other Oriental religions as well? Or is it specifically Christianity? I, I think it would be a, a mistake to lump um, Islam in as an Oriental religion. Is, Islam is an Abrahamic religion um, de derived directly from Judaism. Um, and therefore has to be lumped in with them rather than with r oriental religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, fundamentalism, it really comes back to the previous question of this young lady here. Um, fundamentalism is a religion that's based upon uh, a holy book, on holy scripture, on holy tradition, rather than on a critical examination of the evidence. Uh, whereas a um, a critical thinker will say, I will examine the evidence and I'll change my mind if the evidence leads me to change my mind. A fundamentalist says, it's written in my holy book and that's that. Nothing will ever change my mind. And they really do do that. Um, there are... I was told by the professor of astronomy at Oxford of a colleague of his who is a, a professor of astronomy in an American university who writes learned papers in astronomy, in astronomical journals, mathematical papers, and his mathematical papers all assume that the universe is 13.7 billion years old, but he privately believes it's 6,000 years old. <laughs> so somehow he holds in his head um, a fundamentalist belief, which is based upon scripture, an utter misunderstanding of scripture, but that's fundamentalism. You base your beliefs upon, uh, upon a book, upon a tradition, upon what a priest tells you. You do not base your uh, beliefs on evidence and uh, critical evaluation of evidence. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Nick or Nicholas. Um, I was wondering, uh, what do you think about, um, I know that Charles Darwin, his wife, had uh, different views when I, I assume, I think she was a Christian, from what, from what I understood, you know, I could be more specific. But what do you think about uh, maybe like relationships now? People who have relationships and their partner does not believe as them, like, you know, an atheist to a, to, well, a Muslim or, or something like that. How do you, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you're right that, um, that Emma Darwin, Mrs. Darwin, was a devout Christian. And there is some evidence that she felt some grief at, uh, Charles's um, science and worried a bit that he might be not going to heaven where she was hope hoping to go. Um, and uh, Charles Darwin himself worried about upsetting her. This is one of the theories for why he delayed for such a long time after writing a really rather full account of his ideas, delayed um, some 15 years before he finally um, published them. Um, and it could have been because he was afraid of upsetting his wife. I have heard, again, almost always from America, of stories of couples who have broken up uh, because one couple uh, lost his or her uh, faith and the other one retained it. These are very, very sad stories. I've even been asked advice, you know, what should I do? I love my girlfriend, but, um, but she's she can't tolerate the fact that I've become an atheist. Um, and it's very hard to know what to advise. I mean, I, I mean I'm inclined to say, talk some sense into her. <laughs> it's not that easy. You have to catch the attention of the microphone. Professor Dawkins, um, every time I teach evolution, I'm just amazed at how easy it is to boil it down to 
principles and how easy it is to understand, and I'm more amazed at how little it's understood in the general populace and the objections never seem to have anything to do with the principles of evolution, and it seems that you have to deal with that on a regular basis. So I'd like to yes, uh, it isn't really that difficult to understand. Um, I mean, we're not talking about quantum theory or relativity or even rocket science. Um, this is something which is actually quite easy to understand. It, you have to get your mind around great spans of time, of course. Um, and I am more and more am realizing that the problem is quite simply ignorance. It's, it's in, in a few cases that it's a fundamentalist unwillingness to even listen. But in many cases, there's a perfectly good willingness to listen, but it's just plain ignorance. Um, I was rather moved uh, some years ago. There was a young man uh, who came to Oxford from an American uh, Bible college, and he was a fundamentalist young earth creationist. Not quite sure how he got in, but anyway, there he was. Um, and he, he, he diligently came to my course of lectures, uh, and um, at the end of the term, at the end of the term's lectures, he came down to the front of the lecture hall and pounded the desk and he said, gee, this evolution, it really makes sense. <laughs> and I realized then that he had been a creationist, not because he had, uh, out of conviction, he was a creationist because he just didn't know. Nobody told him. He went to a university where he wasn't taught it. And so I've been asking around, especially on this tour, I've just come from a week as a as visiting professor at the University of Miami, and I met a number of educators, and they told me that in order to be a school teacher in this country, you need to have an advanced qualification in pedagogy. You're taught how to teach, but you don't have to have any qualification in the subject you're supposed to be teaching. <laughs> so you have history teachers who know no history, biology teachers who know no biology, and in the case of evolution, because they know no biology, they're frightened of teaching the controversial aspects of it, because they're frightened of being bullied by bigoted parents, um, because they don't have the backup, th which they would have, if instead of learning pedagogy, they'd learn biology, because then they would know how to handle it. I was told a very, very disturbing story. In Miami, a biology teacher in one of the schools, in, in one of the high schools in Miami, began to teach evolution, as, was, as she should have done. One child objected on religious grounds and complained to her parents. The parents complained to the school. The head teacher of the school disciplined this teacher, made her apologize, and told her she was not allowed to teach evolution because one child of bigoted parents, ignorant parents, had complained. All the other children in the, in the class, therefore, had their education uh, suffer because of this one child. Um, fortunately, this teacher was, has had both courage and, and ingenuity, and she invited a professor from the University of Miami to come in as a guest teacher who was not an employee of the school and therefore not under the jurisdiction of the head teacher. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, Richard, when you mentioned that evolution is controversial, you meant with religious people and politicians, not yeah. with uh, biologists. Oh, no, it's not controversial in, uh, um, among biologists at all. I mean, details of, of it, of course, yeah. are. Yeah. But, but, but um, the fact that we are cousins of chimpanzees and cousins of octopuses is it's a fact, and it's not controversial. This is a question for Frank. Thank you for coming, Mr. Dawkins. Um, I want to know, why do you think it's so hard for African Americans to let go of Jesus and Muhammad and other religions? I don't have any personal knowledge, any personal uh, insight, uh, or much knowledge of American history. Um, I am kind of aware that in the extraordinary conditions of suffering which uh, the slaves went through during the time, during the time of slavery until, until the Civil War. Uh, religion was 
in many respects, the only hope that they had. And I suspect that they were cynically manipulated by religious interests um, to try to, to keep them under control, um, uh, as has been done so often throughout the centuries with people who are suffering under political oppression. Um, religion is wheeled out as a tool of oppression. Um, don't complain, don't agitate, don't revolt in this life. Just hang in there and when you die it'll all be all right. Um, so it's possibly something to do with that, but it, I, it would be presumptuous of me uh, b being white and not, um, not American, really, to, um, to, to say any more. Well, I'll be half presumptuous, because um, I'm at least an American. I think there might have even been a positive side when African Americans could not speak out freely most places. One place they could speak out freely and organize civil rights marches was in churches. So that was a positive feature of church life. And, the, and Martin Luther King would have yeah, been a good yeah, example. Yeah, but then of that. a lot of the negativity and uh, forced belief came along with that for some people, even though there was some good coming out of churches in the civil rights marches. Mm. Our, our foundation, the Richard Dawkins Foundation, did organize a conference at Howard University um, as a deliberate attempt to, um, to speak out, to reach out to, um, to an African American, un an, uh, an American university that's dominated by African Americans. Um, and we got a very enthusiastic reception from those who came, but unfortunately, the numbers who came were a very small number compared to the number of people who are here tonight. And we suspected that there was organized opposition and that people were actually persuaded not to come, but I'm, I'm not sure how accurate uh, that, that is. But to those who did come, it was a highly successful, successful meeting. And we, uh, at that meeting, we launched a, another t-shirt, not this one, um, another t-shirt whose slogan was, we are all Africans, uh, which of course we are. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it was the YouTuber, uh, uh, he said, you could disprove the Bible in three words, basically. Uh, snakes don't talk, is what his <laughs> argument was. Um, I was wondering, do you have a condensed version uh, that you could give to people who maybe doubt evolution, uh, an easy way of uh, presenting it to them? I don't think that many churchmen would accept snakes don't talk as, as a valid disproof because uh, respectable theologians don't take the book of Genesis literally anyway. Um, I think you could probably come up with, uh, with other, um, um, I mean, I think something like the, the New Testament doctrine of um, atonement, the New Testament doctrine of the divine scapegoat, uh, that um, Jesus came and died for our sins, um, as though God, the creator of the universe, the divine mathematician, the celestial physicist couldn't think of a better way of forgiving our sins than to have his son hideously tortured and murdered. Um, that's not exactly three, three words, but it seems to me to be a pretty damning indictment of the, of the central theology of Christianity. Um, now, as for a brief um, summary of evolution to convince people, Herb asked me that, and, uh, and I, I tried to, to give it. I, I said... Um, the evidence from molecular, com comparative molecular data and um, geographical distribution and, and, fo and fossils. And um, uh, it, you, you can't put it into three words, but um, you can put it into a, a reasonably slim volume. You know what I think a difficulty is in evolution, say, compared to astronomy, where astronomy can accurately predict that there will be an eclipse on, uh, a solar eclipse on, I think, May 10th. And those who used to think that, oh, an eclipse, that's a sign of the gods being angry at us, no longer can think that way. Yeah. So evolution de accurately describes the past, but not so much the future. No, but you, you, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen in, in the future. But in a way, you can say um, 
it's a prediction of what will happen if you dig in the ground at a certain point, at, at rocks of a certain age. If you, if you dig in the ground um, and find a rock which is dated by, by, radiometric, by radiometric dating to the Cambrian era, then the sorts of animals you will find mm -hmm. are these animals and these animals and these animals. You will not find any mammals or reptiles. Um, and if you do, the whole thing is instantly disproved. Wittgenstein makes the claim that religious people in expressing their belief are not making direct epistemic claims but rather expressing a certain way of life. Um, he uses the example of the difference between saying there's an airplane above me and I believe in the last judgment. Um, so a religious person and the athe atheist are not playing the same kind of language games because the religious belief is a way of life. Um, so they're not exactly mutually comprehensible. Um, what, what do you, what's your response to this line of thinking? I, did, did you, did I, I you think get it? he's saying that religious people think differently than evidence-based people. So is there any way to deal with that? I could be wrong, but that's what it um, sounded like to me. Well, I think it's true. Um, I think it's true that they think differently. Um, and they shouldn't. I mean, how, how, are you going to, how are you going to have an argument with, with somebody if you say, here is the evidence, and he says, I don't care about evidence, I just know what's true. But, but I think a lot of them have different evidence, like Jesus came into my heart, that's my evidence. Oh, yeah. Um, well, hallucinations, of course, are... <laughs> <laughs> um, there, the, the, I, mean, the, I suppose the answer to that is that people think they're Napoleon, that asylums are full of people who think they're Napoleon, or indeed think they're God. Uh, which is another, another one. Um, you cannot expect to convince somebody by saying, well, Jesus came into my heart and only I know about it. There are people who believe that some no, He'll come into your heart too if you just give yourself if you just over give yourself, to him. Um, there are people who believe that, that some famous film star is in love with them and, and, and mm. they're, they're in... <laughs> Yeah, I've only recently become aware of the uh, University of Chicago uh, doctoral program on the history of religion, and I'd love to see you uh, collaborate with one of their professors there. I'll read you a short uh, quote from one of his books. Throughout history, warriors must be convinced they are engaged in a sacred and rightful activity. It makes killing not only permissible, but an honorable act. The myth must be considered one of the most important narratives in world history. It is essential for all empires to link church and state. I'm not aware of the University of Chicago. What was the key for I missed the key phrase at the beginning of the... Of the Throughout history, warriors, well, our warriors are killing themselves right now. They, yes. Obviously, we don't believe anymore that God is not on our side, perhaps. Yeah. And, the religion has got a sinister aspect that has gone on a long time. The, uh, the school traces the evolution of the Indo-European language, and it's probably started in southern Russia, it's gone to parts of China, India, all the way to Ireland. Uh, their God told them that all the cattle in the world were theirs, Yes. and anybody who had cattle nearby must have st stolen them. Yes. And you say everybody should know not to kill, they did it as a sacred duty. Well, of course, um, it is true that, 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 that the injunction, thou shalt not kill, in any case, only meant thou shalt not kill members of thine own tribe. Um, it, didn't, it didn't mean... Um, and and one, of the, one of the things that, that we progressed over in, in history is a generalization from thine own tribe to the whole of humanity, and maybe it'll progress to other species as well uh, in the future recommend, by the way, Stephen Pinker's great book, um, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which he takes a long historical view of what he sees as the improvement in human ethics uh, from early pre-human times up to, the present, uh, up to the present day. But of course, you're, you're right, and it is an aspect of fundamentalism that uh, people will believe what they read in their holy book, and if their holy book tells them this land is ours, given us by God, uh, for example, um, then 
they won't listen to any alternative view that somebody else might have some claim to whatever it well, is under dispute. Even worse, you know, God was in the real estate business and he promised the same part of land to three to, different yes. religions. <laughs> yeah, religion may be a self-fulfilling prophecy about apocalypse uh, in yes. the Mideast. Yeah. Um, ap apocalyptic prophecies which lead people to uh, say, we don't need to conserve the world because Jesus is coming within the next 20 years, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I had a question just as a young atheist. I've been very vocal and very sure and assured of my beliefs for what will feel like a very long time now. I went through my own series of understanding and believing and came out an atheist through research and real devotion to knowing what the truth was. It's hard for a lot of people to believe that simply because of my age, but once I did come to that belief, I make sure that it's known. I, I fight for my cause, I advocate for it, and I, the idea of spreading it is so much more important to me than simply believing it. So in that train of action, I've, under, I've, I've got a lot of negative speech, of course, and more often than not I'm called an extremist or a militant atheist because I decide to stand up and voice my opinions. So how would you say to not only young or say maybe burgeoning atheists, but to atheists of all ages, how to fight being addressed or belittled in the way of being called militant or extreme simply because they voice their opinions? Well, first I, I, I applaud what you're doing and I, I, I have great regard for what, what, what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when people call you a... <laughs> You could think about it like this. If somebody calls you militant or extreme, it may be because they haven't got any good arguments against you. And so that's all they've got is to, is to call you militant and extreme. That's, that would be one point. Another point would be that uh, you can say relatively mild things against religion and people will hear it as extreme because they're so unused to it. Our society has been lulled into treating religion with kid gloves. It's a very understandable strategy on, on the part of religion to, to, to make that happen. And the result of this is that if you use really quite soft and mild language, people literally hear it as militant and extreme. If you were to compare the, the mild language which we, most of us atheists, use with the sort of language that's used by theater critics or restaurant critics or um, <laughs> sports commentators, um, they may, on, and, and politicians indeed, um, they use far more extreme language. Or if you even listen to preachers who will denounce from the pulpit people like you and me and say we're destined for hell fire in the most extreme militant language, aggressive language, yet society is used to that, accepts it, that's what preachers do. So they're not called militant, they're not called extreme. Whereas if you say something quite mild, it sounds extreme to people and I think you have to recognize that it's, they're not necessarily being dishonest, some of them perhaps are, but they may, it's almost as though their ears have been, have been distorted and they literally hear it as extreme. Because um, if you say it mildly, it, because it's religion, it's, it sounds extreme. And I also think there's an evolutionary process that 50 years ago in South Carolina, you probably wouldn't hear any criticism of religion. And now that people are starting to criticize, that suddenly sounds militant. But the more people that do criticize and come out as atheists, it'll become accepted and it'll no longer be militant. Yep. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Dawkins. I'm here because I read a book called Why Does the World Exist by Jim Holt. And in that book, he talks about you a lot. First of all, have you read the book? I haven't. 
You haven't? No. Okay, because I'm here because he attributed a lot of views to you that um, intrigued me, and then I went and saw your, um, your TED talks. And the question he posits is why is there something rather than nothing? And he interviews a lot of physicists, cosmologists, um, philosophers, mathematicians. He doesn't interview you, but some of your colleagues at Oxford. And so I wonder, how would you answer that question right. of um, why is there something well, rather than Well, I think the, the first, it, it's obviously a, 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 a very profound and difficult question. Um, it's a question not for a biologist, but for a physicist. Um, let me recommend my colleague Lawrence Krauss, his book, um, um, I think his book is called Something from Nothing. Uh, and he is one of those physicists who thinks that, uh, the, um, that, that something sprang into existence from nothing using quantum theory as the uh, rationale for that. I obviously, as, an, as a biologist, not a physicist, cannot elucidate that for you. I recommend his book. What I can do is to say either Krauss and his colleagues are right and the universe sprang into existence from nothing, or they're almost right and the universe sprang into existence from something very simple. Now, something very simple is by definition easier to understand than something complicated. We now live in a world which is extremely complicated. Each one of us has inside our skulls what may be the most complicated thing in the universe. It probably isn't, but it's certainly very, very, very complicated. And this, we understand how we got to this level of complexity from a level of simplicity which, is, which was the level of chemistry. Not the level of nothing, but the level of chemistry. Uh, Darwinian evolution has shown us how you can get, how we have got, from the simplicity of chemistry, the comparative simplicity of chemistry, to the stupefying complexity of modern biology. Now that should be a cautionary tale don't ever say, because I don't understand something, therefore God did it. <laughs> now, yes, we have, now we wait, have wait, 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 sorry, no, wait, wait, sorry, that's, we haven't anything like finished, um, because <laughs> I, was, I was asked about why is there something rather than nothing. Now, the point about biology is that it's a parable. Biology tells you that you can get from simplicity to complexity. Now, chemistry is not ultimate simplicity. The origin of the universe is either ultimate simplicity or something very close to it. And even if it's not literally nothing, it's got to be a hell of a lot simpler than any designer, creator, god could possibly be. And so, to postulate a designer or creator as the answer to the riddle of why is there something rather than nothing is a simple evasion of intellectual responsibility. It doesn't answer anything. It erects a bigger problem than it solves. Not just a bigger problem than it solves, but a hugely bigger problem than it solves. It's just a non-starter, literally. Yes. We have time for just a few more questions. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, do you think that humans would have created the social concepts of good and evil in the absence of religion? Or would you agree that religion was essential to the social evolution of humans? I think that's one for you, Herbert. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I tend to think that, well, I, I think it might be more for you in terms of evolution because I think there might have been species that did go out and kill each other, that didn't have uh, any kind of moral sense. And those genes died out, and we've eventually evolved to learn how better to live with each other. And then sometimes they might have put religious context to it to bring people into a line by saying maybe God told us to do it as opposed to it's just the right thing to do. Yeah. I think that this partly came up earlier when we were talking about... Um, uh, r religion doesn't provide any very moral reasons to be 
to be moral. And we had the thing about the great spy camera in the sky. The point you're making is slightly more subtle than that, which is that uh, maybe historically uh, we needed to go through a phase of being religious before the great moral philosophers. I mean, moral philosophy is a very respectable branch of philosophy which, um, it, it, which at least doesn't have to involve religion, and the best moral philosophers are not religious. And so they come up with theories of, of morality which are often based on ancient and widespread principles like the Golden Rule and, and, other, uh, and other such principles. Um, I don't know whether historically religion was important in leading us to a state where proper moral philosophy could get going. But needless to say, even if, even if religion was necessary for that to happen, that doesn't for one millisecond suggest that there's any truth in religion. Hello, Professor Dawkins. Um, I was wondering, uh, at the end of The Selfish Gene, you uh, brought up the notion of memes and uh, mimetic transmission being part of our culture, another, another part of ourselves that isn't shared with our animals. When you were talking about kin selection, you were saying one of the limitations of that idea is that it can only really be applied to close family members, tribe members that have a similar genotype. I was wondering what you thought of the notion that perhaps those cognitive structures have been redirected towards our mimetic, um, our memotype, if you will. <laughs> and if, if that was a useful idea to think about how to spread our memes, enlightenment memes, in competition with religious memes. So you're suggesting a kind of mimetic equivalent to kin selection. Yes. Um, so a, a, a mimetic kin, and your mimetic kin presumably would be um, other individuals who share similar ideas, whether or not they share your genes. Um, and they might be indeed religions. I mean, it, 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 people who belong to the same religious sect um, uh, are, you could call them mimetic kin. I think it's an interesting way to think about it, and I shall do so. The last question is from a geology student at the College of Charleston. Hi, um, my name's Lindsay. This is a completely off topic from what we've been discussing. I have an actual evolutionary biology question for you. Um, is it your I'm, homework? I, yes, actually. It's, uh, I'm trying to get you to help me with my homework. Um, <laughs> Have you, in your studies of evolutionary biology, come across any evidence that hybridization leads to advancements and progress in evolution? Well, um, hybrid vigor is a well-known phenomenon, such that it's the kind of the opposite of the um, inbreeding depression, which you get when uh, re when close relatives uh, mate with each other. So. I mean, inbreeding depression results from things like lethal recessives um, meeting their opposite number. And so that's, that's why it's best not to mate with your brother or sister or your first cousin. Um, and, and hybrid vigor has been suggested as being the sort of opposite of that. Um, that, it, that, that there have been various, there's it's a, indeed some experimental evidence by Patrick Bateson um, that um, I think he worked on quail, that they, that they prefer to mate with individuals who are not too closely related to them and not too distantly related to them. And his suggestion was that, that, that there was a, an, a, a, a certain amount of hybrid vigor which was, was favored by, by natural selection. Um, agriculturalist breeders of animals and plants um, know the phenomenon of, of um, hybrid, hybrid vigor, yes. Yes, yeah. I just wanted to mention, we're in the largest auditorium on campus. We have standing room only, as well as sitting room, and there are two other large rooms that are also completely filled. Now, three others. Now, Charleston old timers <laughs> might, might remember in 1998, when the College of Charleston beat the University of North Carolina in basketball, and our former College of Charleston president, Alex Sanders, called it the greatest day in the history of the college. 
I think most of us here tonight would say that having Richard Dawkins at the College of Charleston is even better.